So as uh, Professor Tan mentioned, uh, my today's lecture as a webinar is on <clears throat> importance of green finance for meeting the SDGs in the post COVID-19 era. So the topic of green finance uh, is important and the importance of it increased by the, I mean, in the wake of COVID-19 because um, in the wake of COVID-19 and the economic recessions, um, new investments in different uh, sectors, including in renewable energy sectors and green sectors, um, reduced drastically. <clears throat> Therefore, in the post-COVID-19 era, this topic will be more important if we want to achieve the goals that set by um, different nations, including the uh, Paris Agreement goals, including the uh, climate-related goals of the SDGs and so on. Uh, so if we want to keep the pace of uh, growth in the green sector, this topic should be highlighted. So this is outline of my presentation. First, I will introduce the topic and the background, and then I will talk about the challenges for the development of green energy projects. And after that, I will move to the solutions, including the role of institutional investors and long-term investment and utilizing um, spillover effect for increasing the rate of return of green projects. And then I will provide a solution for a smaller scale energy project. And next, another innovation, which is called green credit guarantee scheme and next role of public financial institution and finally the conclusion and policy recommendations. So first the introduction, unfortunately the most disappointing aspects of the contemporary global economy uh, is the low uh, rate of investment in sustainable projects. In 2017 and 2018, the global investment in uh, renewable and energy efficiency declined. In 2019, it gradually increased. However, um, in the wake of COVID-19, the investments in renewable energy projects uh, shrinked by about 10% and the new investment in energy efficiency dropped by almost 12%. That as I've mentioned, the, um, this is because of, first of all, because of the economic recessions that came after COVID-19. And in addition to that, it is because of the drop in fossil fuel prices. Fossil fuel prices are considering as the main substitution and competitor for the uh, renewable energy. And thirdly, because of uncertainty about the uh, market, these markets. So uh, green energy is directly and indirectly related to several SDGs. So SDG 7, SDG 11, and several other SDGs are indirectly related, such as SDG 13, 3, 14, and 15. So this shows the importance of this topic that has been already endorsed by the um, global leaders also. But why? especially in this region that we are located in, why this topic is important uh, and it is more important when comparing to other regions. So the reason is that the main reason is due to the emissions which are coming from the fossil fuels and the climate change that they are causing. So unfortunately about 40% of the uh, CO2, I mean, global CO2 emission is coming from Asia and Pacific and 60% rest of the world. And due to the increasing demand in the, for the electricity, it expected that this 
um, emissions uh, increased even more. So <clears throat> China, India, Indonesia, and many other developing countries and emerging economies, they, they will have huge demand. Currently, they have huge demand for energy and electricity, and they will have more demand in future. So therefore, it's expected to have a higher demand. So although there are lots of good progress, especially from the side of China, good investments. And in, I mean, China is among the top countries for developing renewable energy, but still coal and other fossil fuels are the main mover of the economy. So this shows the importance of energy transition and moving to a cleaner. So there are several challenges that I will explain uh, these challenges for the development of um, renewable energy projects. So, but the main challenge is coming from the finance that the difficulties that these projects have for um, accessing to finance, for accessing to private investments. Therefore, in the, the post-COVID-19, we need to have uh, imperative policy reforms in order to fill this investment gap, such as the taxation, for example, global and regional carbon taxation, national or regional rules, regulations and strategies on financing, supporting policies for facilitating the issuance of green bond, establishment of green credit rating to measure the greenness of projects, targeting the energy subsidies, Majority of the energy subsidies are still going to fossil fuels, reducing the direct and indirect subsidies to fossil fuels and introducing public de-risking tools such as green credit guarantee scheme for reducing the risk of green investment that I will define. So about this region, um, that which is the focus of our present my presentation, uh, Currently, almost 88% of the energy um, consumption is from the uh, fossil fuel sources. And share of renewable energy is maybe less than 12%. So in other regions, the situation is almost similar and uh, fossil fuels are mainly dominating. But when we are looking at the share, for example, share of fossil fuel in Asia Pacific comparing to Europe and or comparing to North America here is larger. So necessity of green finance for sustainable global economy is uh, what has been presented in this background and in this introductory part that I showed. So therefore, introducing green finance and opening a new separate file of finance, which is called green finance is needed. So it means just by relying on conventional financing methods, just by relying on bank loans, we cannot fill the huge financing, finance gap of a green sector. And we need to scale up the financing by opening a new file, which is called green finance. So this book is result of almost three years of work and more than 60 contributors contributed to this book. Professor Jeffrey Sachs, Professor Win Tai Wu, Professor Yushino and myself, we edited this book and it is available if you want to know more about uh, green finance and all um, everything regarding green finance is available in this handbook. So in order to show that what is the size and what is the magnitude of investment which is required, this figure is showing, I mean, it is illustrating this gap. So in the developing world, the largest demand for infrastructure investment as a whole is for uh, developing Asia. And in developing Asia, among all different types of infrastructure, power sector, it means energy, has the, the highest demand. So 56% of the climate adjusted 
investment uh, requirement for infrastructure is for power sector. It means between about uh, between 2016 until 2030, the demand for infrastructure investment in developing Asia is about 14.7 trillion US dollar. And after power, it is transport sector. So this shows how huge is this uh, requirement. And among different Asian subregions, East Asia, including China, um, has the highest demand for investment. After that, South Asia, Southeast Asia, Central Asia, and so on. So next, um, I'm going to talk about the challenges. What are the challenges for the development of Green Project? Because everyone, all of us, policymakers, leaders, academia, experts, we all know that green energy, renewable energy is good. And uh, the importance of it and the advantage of it is not hidden for anyone. So it is clear that it is good for the environment. Living in a green environment, of course, it is much better than living in a polluted cities and polluted environment. But why? Although we all know that all these benefits are there. Why? Just 12% of our energy is coming from renewable energy and majority of our energy is coming from uh, fossil fuel. So the reason is that currently still there are several challenges associated with them. The, the most important challenge is that for developing renewable energy projects like other infrastructural projects, long-term financing is needed. So just providing finance is not enough. Long-term financing, not short or not medium-term financing. Next, there are various risks associated with green projects. Rate of return or the profit of investment in these projects are generally lower when comparing to brown projects, when comparing to fossil fuel projects. And fourthly, lack of capacity in the market actors, that I will define each of these uh, challenges. The first thing is lack of long-term financing. Asian financial systems are dominated by banks. So banks are the main major source of financing in most uh, Asian economies, including in China. So in China, majority of the uh, in China, majority of the financial market uh, is dominated by banks and share of bonds, uh, stock market, insurance companies, pension funds are smaller when comparing to banks in Malaysia, in Philippines, in Indonesia, in Japan. Uh, banks have the major share. So bank, banks' resources are coming from deposits. So we put deposit at bank, then banks are using these resources as a source of funding for different projects. They give loans. Bank resources, which are deposits, are mainly short to medium term. So when we want to have one year deposit, when we want to have two years saving, three years saving, five years saving, we put money at bank. But when we want to have 15 years, 20 years, 30 years saving, we usually don't put money at bank. We look for other so, uh, sectors or other institutions. So this means that bank resources are mainly short to medium term. Therefore, they could not allocated for long-term projects, long-term projects, including infrastructural projects. So it will be a maturity mismatch. It will be maturity mismatch if they allocate it. So therefore, maybe banks are not the priority uh, for funding green sector because, because of different maturity. Next uh, challenge is existence of various risks with this sector, including technology risks. Many of green technologies are in early stage of development. When comparing to brown technologies, uh, 
uh, or fossil fuels technologies that many of them back to almost 100 years ago or even more, more than that. Feasibilities matter and several other risks, including exchange rate risks that I will explain them, operational risk, risk of natural disaster, which these are common for not only specific for uh, green projects, but for these projects and uh, credit risk and as well. Uh, so I mentioned the uh, existence of exchange rate risk. So why? Because when we are looking at the green technologies, green technologies are coming from different countries and green technologies or green products are result of a regional or global supply chain. So it means we cannot find a country, even China, that produce all green technologies. China is also need to import some products. For example, we see here that we looked at four technologies, wind turbine, LED package, lithium cell, and photovoltaic modules. China is net exporter of wind turbine, but net importer of LED package, net exporter of lithium cell and PV modules. Germany is net exporter of wind turbine, but net importer of LED package and lithium cell and PV module. So these are the final green technologies. But even when we look at the components, for example, PV modules, China needs to import some materials, needs to import batteries and some other things. And so it means there is a supply chain. Therefore, exchange rate is matter. Remimbi yen exchange rate, remimbi US dollar exchange rate, remimbi euro exchange rate fluctuation is affecting the final price. Uh, so it means the ex exchange rate risk is important. Next challenge, the third challenge that I showed uh, that I introduced is the rate of return. That the rate of return of these projects is generally lower, although Maybe you mentioned that, for example, solar is very feasible now and it is competing with coal. I agree, but I said generally and generally green technologies are in the earlier stage often of development comparing to uh, fossil fuel technology. Therefore, maybe some of them are not always commercially viable. So because of that, this is making green technologies more expensive and riskier ventures. So another reason is because another reason that tend to the expensiveness of this project is that generally there are lots of policies for supporting fossil fuels. Therefore, the competition between fossil fuels and green technologies are uh, unfair. According to a study done by OECD, just in OECD member countries, there are 800 different individual policies for supporting fossil fuels, 800 different uh, policies. Another type of subsidy, which is an indirect one, is that fossil fuel companies are not taxed efficiently. So it means there is a discrimination. Therefore, the competition would be unfair. So next is the lack of capacity in the market actors. So investment in low carbon projects are undermined because of lack of familiarity, limited information and knowledge, limited expertise on green infrastructure. When we ask, many investors, government officials, different stakeholders that what is green? There is no clear definition by what is green from them. And uh, so even among the experts, it is difficult to define it. Another thing is lack of data. So I'm a researcher, I'm working in this area so difficulties of accessing to green data is another obstacle so according to another study done by oecd just in oecd member countries in order to increase the increase the capacity knowledge of 
market actors, about 50 billion US dollar investment is required. Up to now, I talked about the challenges. And from now on, I'm going to talk about the solutions that, okay, for the solutions, what should we do? So I mentioned that banks might not be very suitable solutions or suitable institutions for funding these projects. So, so what should we do? Uh, institutional investors, including insurance companies, pension funds, these could be very suitable. So China developed pension funds and insurance companies are also growing. The insurance penetration is increasing in China. People are buying more insurance product. So it means in the financial portfolio of Chinese households and Chinese companies, share of insurance is increasing. So insurance companies and pension funds are usually holding long-term money, 20 years money, 30 years money, 40 years money. Therefore, these could be a suitable uh, institutions for funding infrastructure projects, which are long-term projects. And uh, in OECD member countries, so listed companies, institutional investors are holding or managing 100 trillion US dollar assets under management. But unfortunately, less than 1% of these huge assets uh, already invested in infrastructure project, less than 1% in the whole infrastructure and share of green infrastructure is a tiny portion of the infrastructure. So it means if they have enough incentive for bringing a portion of the asset which is under their management to this sector, that would be very helpful. Another solution is utilizing a spillover effect for increasing the rate of return of energy projects. So I mentioned that green projects, usually they have lower rate of return comparing to fossil fuel projects. For the investors, although we have impact investors as well, but for the general investors, only two things is important, rate of return, risk. So they are looking for higher rate of return, lower risk. So if governments wants to promote this sector, policies need to target these two things. So for increasing the rate of return of these projects, we have a solution. And this is so-called Use, using a spillover effect. But I'm going to explain what is it and how to utilize it. Electricity tariffs are often regulated by governments. So governments, in order to increase the social welfare, usually set the electricity tariffs low. This means that this is one of the reasons that private institutions are not so much interested or difficult to enter to this sector. In order to increase the investment in green projects using a spillover effect, using a spillover effect is um, very important and it can increase the rate of return of this project. But what does it mean and how to increase the um, how to increase the uh, rate of return? So imagine that there is a region which is unelectrified. This region is unelectrified. Then government has plan for establishment of a um, power project, electricity project in this region. But government wants to bring the private investor to this a project. But as I've mentioned, because of these risks which are existing, private sector does not show interest. Then government announced that if um, private investor come to invest in this project, I will give some incentives. But these incentives are not coming from the government budget. These incentives are coming from the spillover effect. But what does it mean? Imagine that this region, which is unelectrified, then we have 
electricity in this region by establishment of a power uh, grid, then gradually more businesses will be created in that region. More small businesses, more, more shops, more hotels, more restaurants, and the price of land will increase, price of housing will increase. And uh, so this is called a spillover effect of power supply. So this uh, increase in the output of the region is due to the uh, establishment of such infrastructure, which is a power infrastructure. Then because of increase in the regional output, then governments can collect more taxes from this region. This is called a spillover tax. So what we propose is that governments can refund or governments should refund a portion of this spillover tax to the private investors. That will increase the rate of return of their projects. So injection of the increased tax revenue into green projects in order to increase the rate of return of those projects thanks to the spillover effect of power supply. So it is possible to measure the spillover effect. So here we, I mean, in this paper, if you are interested to know more about a spillover effect, how to measure the spillover effect. So we developed a model and it is available in this paper in uh, economic modeling. So if you are uh, interested to know more, so this paper is available. So as I've mentioned, the main return or the only return of the power projects for the investors is the tariffs, user charges or the fee that they are receiving. But injection of the tax, which is generated because of a spillover effect of power supply into the projects will increase their rate of return and the actual rate of return of the project will be increased, which is a very good incentive for the uh, investors. So next solution is called hometown investment trust funds. So hometown investment trust funds are a solution, community-based solution for uh, mainly for a small and medium-sized scale green project. So the solutions that I mentioned up to now, such as role of public, or, sorry, a role of um, institutional investors or utilizing the spillover effect of power supply is mainly, are mainly applicable for large scale projects. But a small scale energy projects are also very important for energy transition, especially in rural areas. Uh, when we want to promote the communities, when we want to incentivize the communities to develop the green technology. So the idea came from Japan. So you know that in March 2011, a, a great earthquake, and after that a tsunami hit coast of Sendai and also the Fukushima nuclear power plant, which is called Fukushima Daiichi. After that, due to lack of safety ness and because many people were opposing nuclear power, so Japanese government shut down almost all nuclear power plants and substituted the nuclear loss with importing more fossil fuels mainly. So import of coal increased, import of LNG increased, import of uh, oil increase, also renewable energy increased gradually. So because of this uh, disaster, the energy pattern of Japan changed drastically. So Japan used to rely on different sources of energy, including fossil fuel, including nuclear. But after that, because of nuclear shutdown, now need to rely on fewer energy resources. So this endangered the energy security. 
So I will talk about energy security in the next uh, webinar on, on May 12. But briefly, here I need to explain that because of uh, reliance on fewer energy resources, the energy security in Japan reduced. We did this study uh, in order to find out the sensitivity of different oil consuming sectors in Japan to oil price fluctuations before and after Fukushima. So imagine before Fukushima, for example, when price of oil or fossil fuels increased a lot, then you could substitute it with, for example, in some cases with nuclear. But after Fukushima, the sensitivity of different oil consuming sectors reduced. It means even when price increase a lot, you cannot substitute it with others. So this is endangering the energy security. So for China, for Japan, for other countries, in order to have a higher energy security. So one of the requirements is to have a diversified, a diversified energy basket. Just relying on, for example, solar is not a solution. Just relying on uh, one source is not a solution. So diversification is one of the most important things when we are talking about the energy security. Okay, let me shift to the Hometown Investment Trust Fund. Hometown Investment Trust Funds is a type of a community-based financing solutions. So this book, the left-hand side book is available, but if you want to read it, uh, read the paper about this, this Asian Development Bank Institute working paper is available, which is free for downloading. And I'm going to briefly introduce what is Hometown Investment Trust Fund, what is the concept of it, functions, and so on. So as I have mentioned, deposits need to go for safe projects, not risky projects, because bank loans are coming from deposit and deposits are depositors assets. So banks cannot risk with the uh, depositors assets. And due to the Basel Capital Accord and domestic uh, financial rules and regulations, banks are not allo allowed to uh, allocate their resources to ventures and to risky projects. Hometown investment trust funds are solution or a financial solution, a financial innovations in order to bring risky capital, risky businesses, including renewable energy sector. So it started in Japan for the people who were living in Fukushima in that region. So they didn't like to have nuclear because of the reasons, because of the security reasons that they uh, have seen uh, during the Fukushima. But what is the solution? The solution is coal or oil or other fossil fuels? No, because these are also harmful. So they selected green energy, including solar and wind. But when they approached to banks, as I have mentioned, banks showed that they are reluctant to lend to these projects and they were hesitate. Therefore, they started to collect a small amount of money from the locals, 10,000 yen, or for example, $100, $200, $300. And then using these small amount of monies from different households for establishing solar projects, and wind power project, and then generating the electricity that they uh, um, generating electricity and consuming the electricity that they generated. So these projects, I mean, these types of funds, hometown investment trust funds are project oriented. So it means a fund for one project. And then if the, cons if the generation of electricity, if the supply of electricity is more than their demand, they could also sell it to the national power company and making some profits. And uh, then also bringing, I mean, paying some dividend to the investors in these projects. Then when the project became uh, profitable and running, then banks can come in that stage. 
And if governments wants to support these projects, governments can allocate the carbon tax that they are receiving from polluting industries, polluting projects to these projects in order to increase the rate of return. So maybe you mentioned that this is um, crowdfunding and there is no difference between hometown investment trust funds and conventional crowdfunding. But there are two major differences between hit funds and conventional crowdfunding. The first difference is that, as I have mentioned, for the people who were living in Fukushima and they tried, they selected a clean energy. So initially, they were not looking for profits. But they were looking for sustainability of their region. They were looking for a clean energy that, first of all, it can supply electricity and at the same time, it is um, sustainable. So I always mention that there is a warm feeling behind the investment into these types of funds. The investors are sympathizing with the project with the company or with the owners of these projects and the investors are not solely seeking the profit so this can happen in many other sectors for example in agricultural sector there is a risky uh, project for producing some agricultural product this uh, farmer cannot borrow from bank banks are hesitating but you as an investor in that hometown in that local you like this product you want to see this product uh, from that farm continuing then you can donate or you invest some small amount of money in that project that will help the businesses to uh, continue so uh, through these types of funds many companies in japan after fukushima <clears throat> nuclear disaster they could uh, establish lots of green projects. For example, a company called Music Securities raised about almost 1 billion Japanese yen for establish after the earthquake uh, in order to replace the uh, solar rooftop and establishing solar rooftop. Or another company in Nagano Prefecture of Japan used a similar scheme for the sol solar rooftop. Or 249 people participated in a project for collecting 2 million of uh, US dollar for establishing wind power generator. And they agreed to buy the electricity 5% higher. So it means voluntarily feeding tariff. So it was not imposed by the government. So it, I like optional feeding tariff. I like to buy uh, electricity at higher prices because I know that this electricity is coming from wind turbine or from these solar projects in my hometown that I like that region. Then governments in Japan, government of Japan found out that this scheme is very useful and it is possible to expand this scheme to other risky businesses. But it needs to have rules, regulation, what is the supervision mechanism, what is the regulating. So in Japan, supervision and regulating of the whole financial system, whole financial system means banks, capital market, and insurance companies, pension funds, everything related to stock market as well, is under FSA. It's similar to the UK system financial services agency. So financial services agency through an act, a new act, it called Financial Instrument and Exchange Act issued a type of, a, a type of uh, license. It's called type two financial instrument businesses. But for whom? For a companies which is called intermediate companies. So intermediate companies, they receive license from FSA and FSA is monitoring them, then different project owners approach to these intermediate companies. For example, I want to establish a one uh, megawatt solar plant in Hubei province. <clears throat> then I approach the uh, 
financial authorities of Hubei or the related from the central government or um, from the local government first or from the central government. And then, uh, I mean, um, then the authorities informed me that we already gave a license to an intermediate company. You need to go to this intermediate company. I go to the, this intermediate company. This intermediate company assess my profile, whether I'm an eligible person, I can run this uh, solar project, I have enough knowledge or not. And also assessing my credit history, whether I had any case of default of loan, I borrowed from any bank or not, assessing my credit history, my credit background, and assessing the profit profitability of the project, the uh, outlook of the project. So everything needs to be there, feasibility study, business models, and so on. Then if everything was clear, then the intermediate company will mention that, okay, you can um, use our platform for funding, for absorbing funds, and in a small units of investment. For example, uh, 1,000 renminbi or 10,000 renminbi for each unit. And then the intermediate company will announce this project and the investment requirements and all information regarding myself, regarding my project on their website or on the application, for example, through WeChat. And then the uh, investors, different investors from Wuhan or from the other parts of Hubei or even from other parts of China or even from other countries. Many Chinese are living in different cities in different countries and they feel belonging to their city in, for example, Hubei province and they want to donate or they want to bring some small amount of investment that can generate, um, I mean, green products. So through this way, it is possible to bring money to these locals. But role of this intermediate company is very important. For example, I approach, I mean, one of a CEO of one of these intermediate companies, he's my good friend. I ask him that you, through, I mean, hometown investment trust funds, you establish thousands of funds. And many of them are risky projects. What is the ratio of uh, default? He said less than 1%. So because, why? Because his role is very important as a project assessor to assess the projects very well and to assess the background of the project owner and borrowers very well in order to avoid default or in order to minimize the risk of default. So this is very important, role of project assessor, because these types of funds are not guaranteed by the government. And government is doing indirect supervision. Government is just monitoring and supervising the intermediate company. So thanks to the, this is key, uh, several projects, green projects established throughout Japan that I hope similar a scheme could be established in uh, China as well, because in China also communities are very strong, people are supportive, unions are very uh, uh, strong, so it means it is possible to promote such kind of uh, community-based trust funds. Okay, for the first part of my uh, talk, I think it is enough, it's okay up to here, then as Professor Tan mentioned, let's have a 15 minutes. Yes, Professor? Yeah, yes, Let, let's have a break. break. Let's have a break. break. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, yeah, uh, Professor Fahad can uh, have a rest and, uh, <laughs> and uh, uh, maybe we can use this time to make a brief uh, introduction of our audience, uh, there are some professors from, from other university. Uh, Xu Professor uh, Xu Jia from uh, Huazhong, Huazhong University of, uh, uh, Huazhong Normal University, maybe. Huazhong Normal University. Uh, 
Can you can you help me, Shijia? Oh, is is everybody free to talk? Maybe I can. Hi, Professor. Maybe I can uh, share a few words. Okay, please. Yeah, hello. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm uh, Pak from uh, Malaysia. Um, I'm actually now with uh, UCSR University. Um, I'm, I'm so happy that uh, I have the opportunity to attend this talk. And uh, thank you so much, uh, Professor, for sharing your um, thoughts and uh, expertise on this area. Um, I have learned quite a bit from this uh, talk this morning. Um, I'm interested in SDG, but uh, I do not really know how green financing works. So uh, after today's talk, uh, I have a little bit of uh, information and uh, I hope that you know, I can uh, do more work related to this area uh, over in Malaysia. And, uh, and uh, I hope that you know, in the future, we can actually have some opportunities to uh, invite professors for the talks over in our university. So that's all from me. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, uh, first of all, for participating and also for your comments. It's a pleasure. And yes, so in the first part of my talk, I talked about some uh, instrument and innovation. In the second part, I will also uh, explain it. Uh, and I hope that these uh, innovations also could be expanded to Southeast Asia, especially Malaysia with a well-developed financial system. And also, it's a pleasure to collaborate further on it. Thank you so much, Professor. I will definitely keep in touch with you. Thank you. Thank you. Maybe I can just quickly join in. And, and I would, uh, my name is Stephen DeFille. I'm professor in Tianjin University. Um, and uh, I would also very, very much like uh, uh, to thank for the invitation to participate uh, here. Unfortunately, I cannot participate the whole time because I'm very busy and I have to speak parallel in other, uh, in other uh, conferences also this morning. So that's why I, I have a little bit of uh, uh, patchwork only from, 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 the, from, the, from, from the presentation. But I, I, I think it's very instructive and uh, I wish to thank especially for having invited me to this. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Steven. I, I know that you are busy and you are engaged in another event. Thank you very much for joining. Yeah, thank you. Uh, 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 professor Steven, uh, uh, are you a professor from Tianjin University? Yes, yes, I'm Tianjin University. Yes, 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 yes. Oh, nice to meet you and welcome to Wuhan University when you are available. Oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> yes, I'm sure we have to the possibility to talk later on. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, thank, yeah. You. We, thank you. We, we, we can travel uh, in China, uh, but we can't. In China, yes, so, yes. Fortunately, we can. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, yeah, yeah. Welcome, welcome. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, we, we, we will start uh, soon, later. Uh, we can have a break. Okay, and let's start. This is the um, second part of today's webinar. Let me share my screen. So up to now, I talked about the importance of this topic background and also introduced some uh, innovations and solutions that can help to fill the finance gap of um, green finance. So another solution is establishment of green credit guarantee scheme. Because as I have mentioned, in order to bring the private investors into green projects, including renewable energy projects. Governments need to look for 
policies that can, first of all, increase the rate of return of these projects, and secondly, reduce the risk. For reducing the risk, establish, especially credit risk, establishing credit guarantee corporations are suggested. So credit guarantee corporations are not a new institution. So their history back to almost 1930s that uh, credit guarantee corporations have started and now they are available in different countries. Credit guarantee corporations or CGCs are public institutions owned by government. In order to uh, feel the lack of financing, especially for those sectors that the uh, market mechanism cannot fill it. But CGCs are not bringing money. They are not directly financing. They are bringing guarantee only, only guarantee, only credit guarantee. So the function of credit guarantee corporation, the scheme is consists of three main players in the left hand side as you see in this figure financial institutions or banks in the right hand side we have uh, the green projects or any types of projects which is seeking for finance and in the bottom we have credit guarantee corporations so um, credit guarantee corporations are globally mainly using for small and medium-sized businesses, SMEs, mainly for SMEs. Their main function is for providing guarantee for SMEs. So imagine that in the right-hand side, we have SME. This small business approach to bank, approach to financial institutions in order to apply for loan. But because this SME does not have enough collateral, in order to cover the risk and because there is information asymmetry between borrower and lender, lender refuse the loan application. Lender does not accept to give loan. This is when the borrower, which is the SME, goes to the credit guarantee corporation. So credit guarantee corporation then assess the risk, assess the credit risk of this borrower looking at the history, looking at the credit history of this borrower, whether this borrower has any case of default in the past, uh, what, is the, what are the financial statements, sales, asset, capital, debt, accumulated debt, and uh, other things. Then if everything was okay, then the credit guarantee corporation endorses the loan application and provide guarantee. For example, 80%, 70%, 90% guarantee will be provided. And then after that, the borrower, which is the SME, by having this guarantee in the hand, approach to the bank. Then bank sees that about 80%, about 70%, about 90% of the risk is covered by the government, which is credit guarantee corporation. Then the bank will show interest, will show eagerness to provide loan for these projects. So this scheme is called credit guarantee scheme. It is available for several decades in many countries. What I propose jointly with my co-authors is to apply similar scheme for green sector and establishing a specialized credit guarantee corporations, which is called green credit guarantee. Then the borrowers from green projects, such as a renewable energy projects or any types of green projects, they can approach to the uh, green credit guarantee corporations in order to receive guarantee. So and this paper is available, um, optimal credit guarantee ratio. In this paper, we, uh, um, I mean, because I organized I mean, several CBT events, capacity building events for government officials of different countries on credit guarantee. And when I asked them that, how do you calculate that? What is the optimal guarantee ratio? How to calculate 
whether 70% of the loan needs to be guaranteed or 90%, they didn't have any idea. So we developed a, middle, a model for calculating the optimal guarantee ratio for uh, banks in uh, different countries. And this book is also, the, it's a book that I edited uh, jointly with Professor Yoshino, Optimal Credit Guarantee um, is also provided here. The book is called Unlocking SME Finance in Asia, Role of Credit Rating and Credit Guarantee Scheme. So the book is a joint publication of Asian Development Bank Institute, OECD, and Routledge. So um, this is also in case you are interested to uh, know more about uh, credit guarantee and credit rating. So establishment of credit guarantee, uh, green credit guarantee scheme. Green credit guarantee is a new scheme. This is what we propose. Can help to make the loan supply curve forward, shifting forward. Currently it is backward bending and the credit guarantee scheme can increase the loan supply to low carbon projects, including renewable energy projects. But there are some points that need to be considered. First of all, what is the funding of credit guarantee cooperation by itself? Budget of credit guarantee cooperation should come from where? So in Japan, Japanese case is different from Chinese case because in Chinese case, local governments, they have their own tax revenue, although they are receiving some transfer from central government, but local governments are more independent for the case of China and budgetary side, their budgetary thing is also more. But similar scheme could be approached there. So in Japan, we pay two types of taxes. One is the uh, federal tax that we pay to the Ministry of Finance. And secondly, it is uh, local tax that we pay. So local, ta local governments, it means prefecture level, they are not only responsible for taking care of the city's issues, making cities clean and so on, but they are also responsible for job creation. They are also responsible for you know, promoting companies. And one source of funding for credit guarantee cooperation is from local governments and also majorly from central government, from Ministry of Finance. So Japan has 47 provinces. So each province has its own credit guarantee cooperation. I mean, for those who have traveled to Japan, you see that development is very equal in Japan. So in all provinces, in all parts of Japan, you can see the facilities that you see in Tokyo. So, so it means everywhere the facilities and the development is very equal. So one of the reason behind this equal development is the equal funding. Each province has its own credit guarantee corporation. They are not relying on Tokyo Credit Guarantee Corporation. Some countries, they have only one credit guarantee corporation in the capital. So it means all provinces are depending on capital, uh, on the, I mean the capital center. They are relying on uh, capital's money or the capital of the country's money. So, which is not good. And so this is very important and uh, uh, establishment of credit guarantee cooperation for each province is very important. And uh, credit guarantee cooperation's money, as I have mentioned, is coming from these two main sources and they are not directly funding. They are just providing guarantee. Therefore, by providing guarantee, their um, I mean power, I mean um, the funding power can increase. For example, if you have X amount of capital and you just want to give guarantee, then you can provide this capital for 10 times of the projects because 
uh, I mean, just 10% of the value of the total projects could be provided. So this means that uh, establishment of credit guarantee is very um, important. But in order to have an optimal credit guarantee scheme, there are some points that need to be considered. What does optimal credit guarantee scheme means? Optimal credit guarantee is a, guarantee is a credit guarantee which is not so much relying on government's money. Because governments, they have lots of fiscal issues. So if we want to create another burden for the governments, maybe for one year, for two years, for three years, this uh, scheme can continue, but it cannot be financially sustainable. So it means it is very important to have a optimal credit guarantee uh, scheme. So optimal credit guarantee scheme we need to consider both sides of this scheme. In the left-hand side, we have borrowers, which are green projects, such as low carbon project one or low carbon project two. I brought two projects here. And in the right-hand side, lenders. Lenders are banks, bank one, bank two. So in the left-hand side, borrowers. Borrowers, in order to receive guarantee, they need to pay some fee, which is called credit guarantee fee. Two points are important when we want to adopt an optimal credit guarantee fee. First of all, the guarantee fee shouldn't be same for all projects. It will be moral hazard if we have same guarantee fee for all projects because some projects are risky. When a project is riskier, that project needs to pay higher guarantee fee. When a project is a low risk, lower guarantee fee. It is like insurance. If I am a very uh, risky driver and I had lots of accident, car accident before, the insurance premium that insurance company is charging for me should be much higher comparing to a driver which is very safe driver. So that safe driver needs to pay lower premium rates. So this is one point. Second point is that this guarantee fee shouldn't be constant in all business cycles. The guarantee fee should depend on the business cycles. When we are in recessions, you like currently, similar to pandemic, current pandemic, many businesses, many small projects, many renewable projects, they'll, they will find more difficulties to grow. Therefore, governments for promoting these sectors, they should reduce the fee. Then after that, in the post COVID-19, when one year, two years after that, everything recovered, then gradually increasing the guarantee fee again. So this is in the borrower side. Now let's move to the lender side. Lenders are banks. Banks are also different depending on the risk. Some banks are unsound. Some banks are accumulating non-performing loans. Some banks have a huge amount of non-performing loans, non-performing assets. And some banks are very sound, very safe, with very low ratio of non-performing loans. If a bank is very sound, then the government needs to provide more guarantee ratio. For example, this bank is very sound. Um, for example, Agricultural Bank of China is very sound. Then governments provide 90% guarantee. On the other hand, another bank is unsound or with lower uh, level of soundness, then Chinese government or the local government provide 60% or 70% guarantee ratio. It means, okay, Agricultural Bank of China, if you lend to, uh, <clears throat> for example, green projects, I will guarantee 90%. So having same guarantee ratio for all banks will be moral hazard again. It should be some incentive for banks 
to improve their healthiness. This is important. Another important point in the lender side is that the guarantee ratio also need to depend on the business cycles. When we are in the economic recession, such as current pandemic, the guarantee ratio should be increased. Governments should provide more guarantee. And when we are passing it, when the economy already recovered, reducing the guarantee because then the number of defaults will reduce. Usually in economic boom, number of defaults reduce. Then by having this, we can have a sustainable credit guarantee scheme. It means it is a scheme that can continue for several years and it is not so much relying on government's money. Because as I have mentioned, if we propose a scheme which is so much relying on government's money, on government finance, then this means that it cannot continue forever. So <clears throat> we can, I mean, in this, uh, another paper, in this paper, which is, um, I mean, uh, almost a new paper, we calculated the optimal credit guarantee fee. And we, I mean, the same things that I proposed in this picture, model of it and the way for calculating it uh, provided here in this paper and also the empirically we calculated it for a group of uh, companies we collected the data and that those um, are receiving guarantee and we calculated it. okay <clears throat> so up to now i proposed different uh, schemes now let me show an example from the real world a project which is also a green project, how can we apply these schemes for that? So the example that I'm providing here is waste management project. So waste management projects are a group of projects which are so much relying on municipal's budget. Private investors are usually reluctant to enter to waste management projects. In many developing countries and in many metropolitans in developing Asia, waste, waste dump and lack of landfill for waste became a serious issue. So I did these projects for um, India. So in many Indian cities, waste management and accumulation of waste in landfill, it's an issue, it's a serious issue. And in many large cities in Asia, almost 20% of the municipal budget is going to waste management. So it means it is very serious. And if we find, if we provide a scheme that can bring the private sector into this uh, sector, it can reduce the burden on municipalities, on the local government. So according to a study, I mean, in this study that I have done, and I visited waste management projects and um, finding what are the challenges that they are facing, waste management projects are usually facing with two major problems for the financing. First one is the difficulties that they have for accessing to fixed capital. For example, they need to have facilities, machineries, and so on. Therefore, fixed capital investment is needed, buying land or and so on. Secondly, working capital, and a huge working capital is needed. They need to pay for utilities, they need to pay salaries and so on. So therefore, working capital is matter. Establishment of a credit guarantee scheme, similar to the green credit guarantee scheme that I have mentioned, using the capital from the central government and from municipalities is possible to provide guarantee in order to help the private sector for solving the fixed capital issue. And on the working capital. So on the working capital, as I have mentioned, they need to look for some 
constant source of income that can help them to fulfill the uh, to support the working capital so as i have mentioned landfills became a serious issue in many developing asia in many cities in developing asia so when we have a waste management when we have a waste processing then the part of this land will be freed then we can use this land for renting to other sectors for receiving some rent that rent can be a source of income for many of these waste management facilities on the other hand waste to energy waste to energy uh, that is another source that can generate electricity selling the electricity and providing a sustainable income and thirdly receiving waste solid waste from other cities from even from other countries processing them and receiving fee from them for example for the, doing this project i visited one waste management projects in germany it was interesting that they were importing they were bringing waste from italy from other parts of europe processing and managing here at their facility and receiving fee so that fee is a source for of supporting of supporting working capital in that projects that can be used in other places and this is a scheme that can be established waste management trust funds the left hand side uh, are the solutions that can help to solve the fixed capital issue such as municipalities support in a form of capital for credit guarantee corporations donations from the side of central government international organizations ngos many ngos they are supporting clean environment so they can have these donations in a form of capital in credit guarantee corporations or even investments from communities uh, similar to the hometown investment trust funds that i have mentioned and the right hand side are the solutions rent income electricity uh, selling electricity and receiving it even for the electricity i visited a different uh, waste to electricity plants in china in uh, guangdong province regarding i mean um, another waste management projects that i was doing and i have seen that this is providing a sustainable source of income for many waste management projects <clears throat> and green credit guarantee scheme that i showed um, i mean if you are interested to know about the models how to apply green credit guarantee scheme this paper is available and it is introducing introducing it and the summary of what i have presented articulated in this paper and if you are interested you can <clears throat> see it the final uh, part of my presentation is related to the role of public financial institutions how can we involve public financial institution and how public financial institutions can help to bridge the investment gap or financing gap of green projects so public financial institutions are um, important institutions that can be very useful and many of them in the are existing in the world for example in europe five pfis in the past three years they provided about 100 billion euros of equity and finance in energy efficiency renewable energy and so on such as cdc in france germany um, uh, kfw of germany uk gib eib and ebrd so they can be helpful in different parts of green financing from enhancing access to capital, facilitating risk reduction, improving the capacity of market actors and shaping broader market practices and conditions. But in order to have uh, their suitable participation, there are some points, important points that need to be considered. The first thing is that public financial institutions need to provide long-term financing 
So private banks, as I have mentioned, their resources are mainly deposits. Therefore, they cannot use, uh, they cannot provide long-term financing. But public financial institutions, their budget is coming from the side of government. So they can uh, provide long-term financing. Another thing is to provide a stable interest rate and lower interest rate comparing to private banks. Because private banks are paying tax and they have lots of other expenditures. Public financial institutions, therefore their expenses are lower, therefore they need to provide lower interest rate. Another important thing that need to be considered when we are uh, thinking about involvement of PFIs in low carbon finance is to avoid bad effect of government's role. They shouldn't increase the role of governments in the whole economy. They should avoid crowd, crowding out effect of uh, private loans. So this means that as, as it is mentioned in number five, only making loans where the private sector cannot make loan. If the, prime, if the private bank can, or it means afford and interested to finance these projects, then BFIs shouldn't have involvement. One successful example is the KFW from Germany. And KFW has only one branch in Frankfurt. So KFW, instead of direct financing of low carbon projects or small and medium sized enterprises, SMEs, is providing finance to other banks and through private banks giving this money to the private sector. So it means instead of direct financing, KFW is providing subsidized loans to the private banks and then private banks are providing such kind of loans with low interest to those needy sectors. And one of those sectors that PFIs are needed to be involved is the R&D of low carbon technologies. Because R&D of low carbon technologies is one of those sectors that private uh, in, uh, investors are usually hesitating to be involved Therefore, uh, public financial institutions can have uh, important involvement. Okay, let me conclude my talks and uh, provide some policy recommendations. <clears throat> First of all, especially for developing countries, too much reliance on overseas finance will create future burden for the country. So too much creation of external debts will lead to risky situation, especially for developing economies. Circulating domestic saving and domestic investment and also maximizing non-financing, non-debt financing, such as FDI or remittance or keys. Lack of long-term financing, existence of various risk, and low rate of return, and capacity of um, and low capacity in the market actors are major challenges for development of green projects. Institutional investors such as insurance companies, pension funds, or potential long-term investors in green projects. Utilizing tax revenue by use of a spillover effect of energy projects will increase the rate of return of these projects and will incentivize the private investors. For uh, financing a smaller scale renewable energy projects using micro investment scheme, such as hometown investment trust funds, village funds, and um, such as these could be helpful. Green credit guarantee scheme will reduce the asymmetry of information and reduce the expected default loss. Therefore, will cover a part of risk to unlock the private investment. But it is very important to have the optimal credit guarantee ratio and optimal credit guarantee fee in order to avoid moral hazard and in order to have a financially sustainable credit guarantee 
the scheme. And this table is the summary of the solutions that I provide, for example, for facilitating access to capital, what should we do for reducing the risk, what should we do for raising the rate of return and for increasing the capacity. Okay, thank you very much for your attention. I hope that these um, talks were useful. Uh, thank you very much for Professor uh, Fahed. Uh, this lecture is very interesting and uh, uh, we learn a lot from it. And the next